Good morning. My name is Pastor Joe. Uh, like John said, I, I serve here as the South Louisville campus pastor, along with my, my wife Karen and, and our three kids. Uh, I've been here uh, almost four years, but on staff since May full time. Uh, and just like Brent said, we, we fell in love with this place. We love it here. If, you, if you're visiting today or, or you've been attending, I would encourage you to, to come back and, and, and to, get, to get plugged in. You know, with, with faith and, and family, you know, life gets better. So what I want to uh, talk to you today about is, is kind of a situation that some of us in the room may have found ourselves. Ha, have you ever felt, felt stuck? You ever kind of been in a, in a funk? Like you, you've, you want to do something or you're trying to make, make progress on a goal, and, but you just can't get over the hump. You've had this great vision, you've had this dream, and, and you've come to, to a, a sticking point. Um, what we're going to talk today is, a, is about a guy named Zerubbabel. And talking about being stuck, it's taken me like three weeks to learn how to say this guy's name. <laughs> like, Praise the, the Lord for my wife. We sat across the kitchen table. Zerubbabel. Say it with me, everybody. Zerubbabel. All right, y'all are not stuck there. You've made some progress. That's great. So, you know what? Look at your neighbor right now and just ask him. Just say, have you ever been stuck? You ever been stuck? That's right. All the time, all the time, right? Yeah. Has this ever happened to, uh, to any parents in the room? You, you, you sit down for some, some quality time with your kids. You're like, that's it? No iPad, no Xbox, no Netflix. You are so desperate to have some quality time with your family, you've even decided, listen, no, no TV. Like, we are going to have this moment, old-fashioned quality time at the kitchen table together. And you go and, and you pull out that 400-piece that frozen jigsaw puzzle your mother-in-law got you for Christmas. <laughs> and you're like, all right, we're going we're gonna to do this. And you think that this is the first time that you've ever opened the box, but... What you don't know is, is your little princesses have already tried, and they've put it back in the closet. And so you're working, and next thing you know, you're like, oh, there's, there's Olaf, and, and there's Kristoff, and, and there's Finn. You're making progress. You're like, all we got left is, is the castle and the two girls. We're, we're on the home stretch, and you're going, and, and you look, and you're like trying to race. Who's going to get the next piece? Who's going to get the next piece? You find you got two pieces left, and you only got one piece of puzzle you're stuck. We've got to finish. You're being robbed of the joy of completing this family project, this moment. You had plans to maj posh that thing and put it on the wall. We completed this as a family. So what do you do? You, you go and you're like, everybody huddle up. We're on a mission. We're going to find this piece. Break. You're underneath the table. Your kids are retracing the steps all the way back to the closet. You look, you search, and you, you can't find it. And then you do the most unthinkable thing in my house. We're going under the bed. It's got to be under the bed. Who, last resort, is searching underneath your kid's bed. Uh, right, yeah. If you don't know, that's where the monsters are at. And that's not where the jigsaw piece was. You know, it, being that it's the, it's the past, the midpoint of, of 2018, I have a, maybe another question. How's your New Year's resolution going? Anybody stuck on improving themselves? You know, uh, at the beginning of the year, I, I shared a message on New Year's Eve about New Year's resolutions. And, and one fact that sticks out to me is that only 8% of resolutions made on New Year's are kept. Anybody stuck? You know, I was going to lose 20 pounds this year. Well, it's July, and you're up five. And you're like, well, we're going to make some progress on the backstroke. So we got this. But you're stuck, you, and, and even worse than stuck on like our New Year's resolution, you're actually you're going the wrong way. Yeah. You know, it's a, who's ever watched a, a Saturday morning marathon, a, a fixer upper on HGTV? You're you got Chip and Joanna, and you're you're like we're gonna we're gonna go, and we're so motivated and so inspired, and you see that with a couple of tools and a few commercial breaks, you can renovate a whole house in a half an hour. Yeah. You're like, I'm ready. We can do this. We're going to go, and it's going to be amazing. Yeah. Well, then you, get, you go to Home Depot. You're like, you buy all the naughty pine they got. 
you travel back to the house and you're cutting, you're shaping, you're hammering, and next thing you know, it's two in the morning and you got to go to work the next day. You go to work and you see the pile. You're like, yeah. Two months later, you're having dinner on that naughty pine and you ain't shiplap nothing. This ship is sinking. <laughs> right? You ever, you ever had a, you've been in a, you're in a dead end job. You, you've been there for five years. You, you finally decide to, to go back to school. You, you've, made up your t- you've made up your mind. You're going to see it through this time. You go through all the obstacles and all the hurdles. You, you meet with a financial planner. You meet with a guidance counselor. You, you get your syllabus semester one, semester two, semester three. We've got this. We're making it through. And then what happens? Your ex-spouse calls you and said, I ain't watching the kids at night no more. The bills come in because something went wrong with your financial aid, and now you've got to pick up more hours at work to pay for the bills that are coming in. And what happens? You, you put your dream on hold again. You're like, I'll finish that job. I'll finish that, that uh, degree later. It, you, feel, you feel overwhelmed. You, you feel stuck. Anybody ever went on vacation? Fly into a friend's house in the airport. You're like, hey, pick me up at the airport. They pick you up. Take you back to the house. Hey, look, you stay here. No hotel. It's free. You're like, all right, this is going good. And you wake up the next morning, and they're at work, and they took their car. And you're like, all right, we're vacationing in their living room. <laughs> I could have done this at home. You, you know, there's all kinds of things that you just feel stuck. You feel stuck. Like, all right, one more, and then we'll, we'll move on. Is You know, it, it's late season, and I'm sure that some of you in the room have seen this. Probably never happened to any of the guys in the room, but you've seen it before. You know, there's a guy, and he's talked to his family. He's like, we're going to the lake this weekend. It's going to be, it's going to be amazing. He puts gas in the car, gas in the boat. You hear Taco Bell, you gassed up the kids. You're ready. You talk to your, you talk to your boss. <laughs> yeah, like that. That was, that was great right there. That's, all right. You, you gas up everybody. You're ready to go. You even talk to your boss, and you're like, hey, just let me leave 20 minutes early. I, I just want to beat the traffic. And by some miracle grace of God, he's like, this one time. Everything is going to plan, and you're like, all right, we're going. You head 65 south, you're going to the lake, and trailer tire pops on your boat. Now, if that's happened to you, and I'm pretty sure if it has, your wife's never going to let you forget it, that you were on the side of the road with that flat tire. But you had, you prepared, and you were ready, and you were trying to do everything that you could to get to enjoy something or meet that goal, and something comes up and gets you stuck. And it just feels... It feels overwhelming. Well, you know, maybe you were invited by a friend to Hope City here a few weeks ago or last week, and, you know, you had this experience, and you just decide to follow Jesus, and you know what? You have this amazing moment. You know, your prayer life's awesome. You're hearing from God. You're you're having spiritual conversations with friends and family that you never thought you would have. Some time passes, and you decide to join a serve team or, or go to a couple groups and time passes. And then it feels like your prayers are going unheard. Yeah. God, I just want to hear from you. You pick up your Bible and instead of it feeling like a joyous moment, it feels like a burdenous habit. Wow. You're like, I just want to have that moment again, God. And, and you, your, your, your spiritual life, you just, you just feel stuck. Well, today we're, we're going to learn about a story found in the, in the Old Testament in the book of Ezra. We're, we're not going to turn there. I'm just going to kind of give you like a high, overle- high overview of that story. And see, there was this guy. His name was Zerubbabel, like we talked about. Uh, he hears a message from God through a prophet. The prophet tells him that, that he's going to build a temple. And the temple at this time is where people would go to, to worship God. It, it was more than a church building like we have. It was a place. And it's at that time is where the presence of God was housed. And so this was very important that they actually had a temple because without the temple, there was no presence of God. So he had a very specific dream with a very important task, something that he needed to cover. So he, he's building a temple. He, he's getting to work and you know, it's moving along, and, and before he starts, he hears this message, like I said, from, from the prophet. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you. It, it comes out of a, a different book, and it's, it's Zechariah 4. And it says this. It says, 
And then he said to me, this is, the, this is Zachariah reaccounting the angel to where he gets the message from Zerubbabel. So it's a little, it's a little discombobulated. It's a little out of context here. So there's a guy who had a message who's telling you what the angel to tell Zerubbabel. So, and it says this. It says, this is what the Lord said to Zerubbabel. It's not by force. It's, it's not by strength. But it's by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's army. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain, will stand in the way of Zerubbabel. It will become a level playing field. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone in place, the people will shout, May God bless it. May God bless it. How would you have liked to have been Zerubbabel? Would you have felt encouraged, inspired? Literally, a message from God through a prophet telling you, you're going to build God's house. You're going to succeed, and people are going to rejoice when you finish. So you've got a plan, you've got a purpose, and you've got a promise that it's going to come to pass. And so he's feeling inspired. He, He gets to work, and, you know, to me, there feels like there's nothing more honorable or more inspiring than to building God's kingdom. I mean, what a more noble cause to be like, we are going to see this through than building a temple for God. I would have been felt it's so, so super motivated, so inspired. I mean, who doesn't love a, a new beginning? You know, just think about new beginnings in our lives. Uh, a first date. Right. The first hill on a roller coaster. You're like, here it comes. You're like, so right, we're going to go through something. You know, your wedding day. Your, your firstborn child, buying your first home. Maybe for you the most exciting thing was your first sip of booze or sneaking out past curfew. You felt liberated. You felt excited. You were like, the possibilities were, were endless. Who knew what this new adventure or this new night would, would bring? But then the newness wears off. The excitement wears off. And then you come to a point where it's a grind. You know, the, the vision, the dream becomes a grind. You haven't heard this. You forgot how long ago you heard that message from God that tells you you were going to do it, and you were going to finish, and we were going to celebrate. You just feel like you are, are working. And that's, that's what happened to Zerubbabel. It, it came to a point when he and his team, you know, they finished the first two rows of the foundation. They, set, they stepped back, and, and they celebrated what they had accomplished and see, this is what, another thing that's real common that happens to us. While he's celebrating his accomplishment, people around the town and in the, in the city, the religious people, they came up and they started crying. But see, they remembered a time when there was a greater temple before the one he had started. They had remembered something in the past. Who remembers when you try to do something great? People remember who you used to be. Right. Oh, you can't do that. Don't you know you're a single mom? You ain't going to finish school. No, no. Don't you know you've been married before and you're going to get married again? It, it didn't work out the first time. No. You know, you, oh, you're going to start a business? I mean, you can't even make your mortgage payment. No. All these discouraging words. Well, that's what happened at Zerubbabel. They had, they had memories of this, of this temple. And their memories were, were far greater than the one they raised. And I said, I I think they had this spirit, and this is what I said. They would rather remember the past in sorrow than celebrate the possibility of the future. And see, that's the oldest tactic in the book for the enemy to come against us, and that is discouragement. You know, I think back about in the garden when God made this made this perfect place for Adam and Eve. It was paradise, and He was going to spend time with them. The enemy comes up and goes, you know what? It could, it's good, but you know what? It could be better. You could be just like God. And they put that little, that little thought of it could be better or, or you're not doing a great job, but you could do better or why are you trying so hard? And that, that discouragement that we feel it sometimes, you know, maybe, maybe you've been married for five years and your husband won't even take out the trash unless long taking you to dinner. You feel like the, the spark of your marriage is doomed and you're not going to make it another year. You know, your boss is a jerk, and rush hour traffic's a nightmare. You sent out resumes, and 
They didn't, they didn't do any good. You know, you're not getting any, you're not getting any pushback. You know, you've been, you've had your third kid in less than three years, and, you know, children are a blessing. But sometimes your perspective can change when your wife hasn't had a full night's sleep in 36 months. You know, you can get, you can get discouraged. We, I mean, uh, our bodies, we get tired, we get weary, we get, we get discouraged. With discouragement can come depression. The feeling of failure. And, and, and failure, it, it frustrates us. Failure reminds us that we're not who we want to be. You know, we have these desires in our heart to be something more, to be something greater, but failure reminds us that we're not. Wow. Failure, makes us, failure makes us feel like that we're never going to be able to finish. It's easy. You know, failure is hard, but you know what's easy? Starting. Anybody can start. Woo! Starting to die on Monday. Karen and I are starting, working out tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, we're going to start working out. You know, who ever started training for the mini marathon and still did it, but didn't finish their training? I mean, I went through it, but I definitely didn't finish my training. You know, you start selling essential oils to go on that dream vacation. You want to, you start, you, you've always wanted to start learn, uh, learn another language. You, you started playing the guitar. You know, something, starting is something simple. You get an idea, you pick it up, and you go. But, but what's hard is, is starting over. Restarting. You know, picking back up that dream that you had and, and pressing on. Not only do you still have to work, you have all the work that's in front of you, but you have that, that past discouragement. The frustration that comes with repeating steps you've already done. Babe, we, we've been to marriage counseling. We've already been through five sessions. You know, we tried that two years ago. And then you just resolve to stay together for the kids' sake. Wow. You know, maybe when they, when they all go to college, we'll, we'll separate. You know, you've... And that's... Your, your college credits don't transfer. You, you remember you've tried to get sober before. But what you don't remember is the same thing that Zerubbabel didn't remember. is that message that God told him. That it was not by force, not by strength but by my spirit. You know, many times we, we go through life relying on our own power, believing that if we want it bad enough, we can make it happen. I'll will it through. You know, he doesn't want it, but I do, so we'll make it work. You know, I, if I got to have three jobs to keep this car that I thought was a blessing, I'll just keep working. You know, you, you, you set these things in force, and you think that you'll be able to do it. I wrote this, I said... A life powered by my own strength leads to failure and frustration. You know, you don't, you don't have enough tank in, you don't have enough gas in the tank to make this journey. You know, it, it doesn't matter how fancy the, the GPS system is in your car if you don't have the fuel to move it. You'll see on the screen where you want to go, but you're stuck. You're out of power. Zerubbabel became discouraged, and the construction stopped. The, the temple laid dormant for 15 years. This 15 years of, of this dream that was given to him by a prophet laid dormant. The workers left. The, the mortars dried up. Imagine walking around this city center as Zerubbabel, this, this, tow, this two rows of this foundation that's supposed to be God's house. And, you know, you've got you to gotta go to the market You've got to go visit your in-laws. You're, you're walking by all the time just seeing that dream that God gave you lay dormant. The people around you see that. Yeah, there's Zerubbabel. He was, he was supposed to build a temple, and he, he never finished it. You know, they, they reminded him. They, they mocked him. They mocked his calling. They, they mocked his dream. They mocked the fact that he wasn't able to finish. He was stuck. He was stuck at a point when when God's calling and his power ran out. 
I wrote this too. I was like, remember that the people that will start a project with you, they may not finish it with you. But they'll be there to remind you that you didn't finish. You know, the same people that funded his project, the king, the other believers, you know, they, when, when they started, they brought all their riches and all their strength and all their power to it. But when they got to a sticking point, oh, that was his idea. You know, I, I'm sure some of us have in the room have a, a dream that's laying dormant. You're, you're defeated just like Zerubbabel. You know, what's laying dormant in your life? What in your life do you not have the power to, to start again? What, what relationship do you need to restore that only through God's power will be able? Good. You know, I know that there are relationships in our life that are, that are hard, you know, parents and, and family, and some of them are unhealthy, but, you know, hear my heart. You know, maybe you don't need to restore it with them, but maybe there's other ones that you do need to go back and rekindle, but you're stuck because you know it's going to be hard. You go to the meetings. You, you've read every page and every section of every book of Celebrate Recovery, and you're doing okay. But then you, you begin to grow weary. You just feel like you're... That hundred days you got it, you're not going to be able to keep going. You know, you can't run this race called life to the end on one word, one touch, one encounter. Zerubbabel was told that he was going to build God's temple. And I can't think of anything more inspiring, more noble, more in, in tune with, with God's will. What about the dream you have of starting a business that you're ignoring? Wow. You're too analytical. You've done the numbers. You've got kids. You've got responsibilities. And it just don't add up. Wow. So you put it on the back burner. You think that one day you'll start it. You see, discouragement doesn't always have to come from sin and, and bad habits. We can be so confident in ourselves and in a situation that we don't allow God's Spirit to move in our life. Wow, good. So good. I can't. Look, it doesn't work. But you don't, you don't allow the Spirit to inspire you, to push you through, to get you unstuck. Amen. You know, for the, for the entrepreneurs and the business people in the room, I just want to remind you that, you know, today that Places like Amazon and Apple and Google, they, they started at a coffee table. Right. Yeah. They started in a meeting. They, they started in a garage that moved to a building, that moved to this, that moved to Amazon, Google, and, you know, they're huge, right? Yeah. It all started with that. Who in the room has their cell phone? Pull it out. I don't have mine. Mine's down there. I got, my, my pants are too tight. I can't put a phone and a, and a pack in here. <laughs> These ain't even the tight ones. Yeah, sure. Woo, black and black. Did you see that? I eat carrots. <laughs> in the room here, you got your phone, and you got that little Bible down there, the YouVersion Bible app. Who's got that on their phone? Anybody in the room? Yeah. Right. I heard this great, this great podcast, and he was talking about the, the YouVersion Bible app. It just celebrated its 10-year anniversary, the launching of God's Word into, into millions of people's hands. You see, when they... When they started the development of the app, Apple hadn't came out with the iPhone yet. So they knew they were out in front of it. They were blackberrying it up and yeah. Nokia brick phones. Yeah. But they were moving they were moving up with it, right? And they saw an opportunity and they went they went to develop this app. They didn't even know they didn't even know if Apple would accept a Bible. They didn't know if like, oh, if I'm gonna put this in the app store, if they would even approve it. So they, they didn't get discouraged. They didn't get, they didn't get frustrated. And you know, here's the, the guy that developed the app. His name was Bobby Grunewald. He, this is the person that God put this dream in his heart. You know, he didn't write a stitch of code. He didn't finance it. He just went through and put the vision in people's hearts that knew how to do it. Wow, that's good. Today... 
the Bible app has over 300 million downloads. There's 300 million of those little apps on these devices, right? He didn't allow a situation, he didn't allow hurdles, he didn't allow the outcome to stop him. Here's something that was so inspiring in that story is the developer of that app was not a team. It was a 19-year-old. Wow. In the podcast I heard, they didn't even just say it was a man or a woman. They just said it was a 19-year-old. And when they gave this vision to the 19-year-old, they went, hey, you got the weekend. Figure something out. We're going to put it up on the store. See, they didn't know if it was going to work or not. They didn't know if Apple was going was to take it and put it on the Apple store. Right. So they just like, hey, just do what you can with what you got and we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's good. So, and that's what they did. A 19-year-old working a side project yep. for his boss. Yep. Ten years later, 300 million downloads. Man, so good. Just don't let, don't let your situation keep you stuck for an inspiration. Yep. You're inspired. you got a dream. Go for it. Good. In closing, this is what, I'm gonna, this is what I want to go through right now. And this is the, the part of the story when Zechariah inspires Zerubbabel again. In Zechariah 4.8, you hear this. And then another message came to me from the Lord. See, Zerubbabel was going to hear from the Lord again. And who in the room needs to hear from God again today? Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of the temple, and he will complete it. In Zechariah, in Zechariah 4.10, he also continues on and says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the beginning, Amen. to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. Wow. Now I have this big, long rabbit trail to talk about plumb lines. It's a construction tool. I was going to geek out on it. But what I'm telling you today is, what have you laid the foundation for in your life? What has God put in your heart that only you can finish? And it's not our strength. It's not our might. It's not our power. You know, you get in, this, you get in the airplane, you're on the runway, you take off, Everything's going great. And then you get in the clouds and the, and the turbulence starts. You're up and down and shaking and you're like, what are we going to do? Do you get the parachute and jump out? No, you, you give it more gas. Yeah. The pilot powers through and you know what he does? When he gets up on the other side of the clouds, through the turbulence, God was there the whole time. God sees you in your frustration, in your discouragement, in your failure. It's through his spirit that lifts us over the clouds to see that he was there the whole time. God's not going to give you a dream in your heart that you're not going to be able to complete. But you're not going to be able to complete it by your own power. When you're feeling stuck and your power can't get you out and you can't go on, it's a good thing. It means you're almost there. God's Spirit frees us from failure. It's not by force nor by strength, but by my Spirit. You know, don't live a life stuck start again. Pick, pick that dream up that God has given you. You know, I'm going to do something now, and I'm going to encourage you is that after I speak, the band's going to come back up, and, and they're going to lead us in a time of worship. And up here in the front at the stage is there's going to be a prayer team. And that prayer team are people that, they're not perfect, but they believe that it's not by might, not by force. They believe in the Spirit. And maybe today when you come up here and you just need to hear the message that you're the one who's able. 
You're the one who laid the foundation of the temple and he'll complete it. I love taking scriptures and replacing characters' names and putting my name in it. I love it. Joe, it's not by power. It's not by might. It's by my spirit. Joe, you know that dream I gave you? You're going to finish it. Hearing again. What a great message. Zechariah had to come and tell him again. Maybe the day God is telling you again, live that dream, but not by your own power, through my spirit. Pick back up your sobriety again, but not by might and not by spirit. Maybe you need to go get your kids out of kids ministry and bring them up here as a family. And that same altar you got married at, maybe you need to come down here today and meet God again in the altar and commit your life back as a family. You know, I really struggled with this message because I need to hear it. I cried and struggled and it really pushed me. I'm in over my head, guys. Now, last year at CYC, Pastor John and I spent this time in this little room in one of the dorm rooms, and I was like, man, I really just feel like God wants me to, to do full-time ministry, but Amen. I got a job and kids and debt, and I, I'm unable. You know, and, and Pastor John, I love him. He was like, Joe, you just never know. Right. You just never know. We'll pray, and we'll see what happens. You know, and I went to CYC again this year. We just got back. I went up and visited for a day. And in that moment, with 1,600 teenagers, God spoke to me. You know, and it wasn't an audible voice. I don't mean nothing crazy, but I do mean that during that message, a man came to me, and he put his hand in my hand, and he said, by God's mighty power. He didn't say Joe's power. He said God's mighty power. Maybe today you need to come down here and let somebody put their hand in your hand and remind you. Let's pray.